Back here on the Rich Eisen Show is a gentleman who uh, appeared in our studio uh, a few years ago, and right now he is back here uh, with a book version of the movie and the TV show that has been just terrific to remember with the movie and then relive and watch uh, with the television show Cobra Kai. The book called Waxing On, The Karate Kid and Me is available now wherever you get your books. Ralph Macchio here on The Rich Eisen Show. How are you doing, Ralph? No, I'm great, Rich. Thanks for having me, man. So Thanks. We, we, got, we got the book, right? Um, yep. And uh, why the book? Let's get to the, let's get that right off the bat. Well, it was, um, <clears throat> You know, I felt I had a unique story. I'm sure everyone starts this off with the same. Well, I felt I had the unique story, but right. I, I really have something with, uh, you know, uh, I've been asked for a couple of years now, even before Cobra Kai hit, would you ever write about the making of that film that has been so inspirational and impactful for decades and, you know, became part of pop culture and sort of a celebratory look back at the film uh, and pop culture, my life and all that. And, when you know Cobra Kai hit, and now, um, and then the pandemic hit, now I had okay, what am I going to do now? You know, we're, we're on lockdown. I started to write down chapter titles and I started to write down little paragraphs of the journey and walking in these shoes and and sort of what I've gained from it through my life and what the experiences have been and the sort of behind the scenes, never been told stories of the making of how you catch a fly with chopsticks or the casting of Arnold from happy days. Now the great Pat Morita is Mr. Miyagi. I mean, how those things came to fruition. Cause when I tell those stories over a cup of coffee or at dinner, everyone just leans in. And I knew I had that. I had a, an interest, but what, what really kicked it uh, to another level is having the relevance. So it's nostalgia and contemporary relevance at the same time. And that's quite unique. And and so it's kind of only a story I can tell what it's been like walking in those shoes, the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows, but ultimately the embrace at the end of it of this gift that has kept on giving. Why do you think the Karate Kid is so popular, Ralph? Um, because it it it's a combination of things in my view. Why it works and has stood the test of time as a piece of storytelling is it... It works on a human level. The themes are still relatable. Um, mentorship, bullying, uh, you know, fatherless teen, single parenting, moving to a new town, fish out of water, overcoming obstacles, good over evil. You could check down a bunch of boxes and that in storytelling, those are good human relatable stories, uh, themes. Um, the pop culture of it all, what the internet has done, what the, what get them a body bag means, what sweep the leg, why I hear that at every sporting event, or you know get them a you know or or you know you know the wax on of it all. I mean, uh, just the the Mr. Miyagi magic of it, that secret sauce of that character, which really is the Karate Kid. Mr. Miyagi is what separates it from just another you know, an 80s overcoming obstacle kid teen movie. That's that adds another dimension. So, I mean, it's all those pieces, I think, why it has stood the test of time. And then, of course, is the kick legal or not? You know, then it becomes well, something else. We know it's not legal, Ralph. I mean, we know <laughs> that kick is not a legal kick. Right, right, right. right. Whatever, whatever it takes to continue the discussion for decades <laughs> on end is what it is. I think, so, I think, you know, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, no, it's great. I, so what, how did it come across your desk, your agent, your world back in the day, the script for you? Um, I was, uh, yeah, I just come off the film, uh, The Outsiders, Heard which was a big, big break for me and a great role um, in a Francis Ford, Francis Ford Coppola movie with a couple of actors that might have worked since. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm sitting in, as I write it in the book, I'm sitting in this faux leather black beanbag chair with shag carpeting in my room and the phone rings loud, a typical you know, dial phone that I still had. I might have been push button by then. That's that's how behind the times I, I pick it up and they said there's a a script uh, called The Karate Kid being made by the guy who made Rocky. The first thing I said was Karate Kid. Is this an after school special? A cartoon? Right. What is what kind of title is that? 
uh, clearly one that I would be carrying for the rest of my life <laughs> that I didn't know at the time. And um, they were sending a script uh, to read uh, for, I didn't know if it was the director or the casting director at that point. And um, you know, then I'm on the train from from Long Island to on the Long Island uh, Railroad heading to New York City to meet with John Avelson, who directed uh, Rocky of of all movies. And and uh, our my first reading with him is actually you can see it on YouTube. He posted it years later, um, and it's really kind of remarkable to see Daniel Larusso was Daniel Larusso from from Jump Street. You know? And when did Pat Morita get hooked up? He was, there was more resistance. Uh, there was certainly resistance to him because of the, um, I think Jerry Weintraub, the late great producer, yeah. larger than life producer, Jerry Weintraub was like, I remember him. He was a Catskills comic. There's no way he's going to be in this picture. You know, they were looking at Toshiro Mifune or, you know, these uh, great Akira Kurosawa, you know, seventh samurai actors. Because Miyagi had humor written into the role, but it he also had great dramatic depth. So you wouldn't, it's amazing because there is nobody else but Pat Morita. I mean, and it was John Avildsen and his uh, casting director that pushed for that and forced everyone to to see Pat's tape. And uh, and then it was about putting us in a room together. And it was, it was instant ease of chemistry I don't know how to I, that's how I describe it it really I call I call Pat and his uh, soulful magic uh that's what it was when I worked with him it sounds corny and all that other stuff but it was just easy and natural you know well written certainly um but there was just something a little little magic dust there and it's still you know when I see those scenes they still have that you know. Ralph Macchio here on the Rich Eisen Show. His new book, Waxing On, The Karate Kid and Me, is available now wherever you get your books. I want to rewind to our part of this conversation about The Outsiders. What in the world was that like? I mean, Francis Ford Coppola. Um, I've spoken about this with C. Thomas Howell and also with Rob Lowe on my show. And mm -hmm. he, he said, there, it, you know, it was like a fraternity in college. Yeah. It was like your college years together. Yeah. Uh, in a way, uh, what about your recollection of being on that set? Yeah, well, I mean, it was, listen, it was the movie everyone wanted to be in or every young actor wanted to be in. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I read the book in seventh grade. So I, you know, it was beyond dream come true time. And and obviously Coppola having seen The Godfather at that point and knowing what that was, it was like, you know, I'm in... I'm at Yankee Stadium, if you will. You know, this is not an out-of-town tryout. You know, it really felt like, you know, the big time, right? Um, and there was a competitiveness with all the guys, you know, one one better looking and more athletic than the next. But I was written, you know, the character I played was kind of the runt of the litter and the lost puppy dog kind of uh, char a great character, Johnny Cade. He gets to say, stay gold, pony boy, which is... You know, when you think of some of the, the iconic lines from Karate Kid or even My Cousin Vinny, another one that has a couple of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's really amazing. I've got, had a few of those films that have had yeah. those great, great cinematic lines of dialogue. But working, it was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which I just stopped in on the book tour. And I was actually sitting with S.E. Hinton in front of wow. 1,200 uh, people who came to buy the back Waxing On book and just had a nice conversation three days ago. Um, so I still there's like a kindred spirit with with all those guys and um, and Francis as well. There's just it's where it started for so much of so many of us. You know, it was a um, everybody was very um, um, focused and obviously with Francis at the helm, you wanted to please you want you positioned yourself. You know, these are young actors, the stallions waiting to, you know, when they load those horses in before the, you know, they they start the the uh, preakness or the Kentucky Derby. That's kind of how it was on the first day of shooting. You know, um, uh, I took it very seriously. If anything, I almost took it too seriously at first because I was putting so much weight in this you know, this role that I was sure I was going to win an Oscar for, just like, you know, you have all these, these dreams going forward. 
Um, but it's really one that I am proud to have on the resume. That goes without saying. Is it true you got kicked out of a hotel because you guys trashed something in the lobby? Yeah, well, those, yeah. Like, Listen, yeah. I'm sure this what is happened? Rob's story or Tommy's story. I was always the guy, I write this in the book. I was the guy, that, I think they was trying to get a t-shirt made for me that said, do not disturb. Uh, <laughs> because I would always have the do not disturb. I'd have my, my boom box playing Blessing Springsteen or Cheap Trick. Uh, and, and that's what I was doing. I was just, you know, that was my thing. Um, and, uh, like I said, I, I alluded to that. I took it a little too seriously at first. So I was, I was the guy that was like, just focused on the work, but we, we had some, uh, fun at the Tulsa Excelsior. It's now the double tree. It will <laughs> never be the same, but here's, here's one little story I will give you. I was back yes. in Tulsa a couple of years back because mm -hmm. I, I always like returning there because it's really, that's where it all kind of began, you right. know, and, and, uh, and I went to the Doubletree Hotel, uh, which was the Tulsa Excelsior, because that's sixth floor. It was like me, Dylan, Cruz, Rob Lowe, Amelia. I mean, one floor. Could you imagine? <laughs> you know, all basic, like double bed kind of hotel rooms. And I went and I got out the elevator and my room, the door was open and the cleaning person was cleaning the room. And I, I walked in there just for a second. And it was, it was like, I mean, I didn't recognize they changed the room, but yet it felt like I'd been there before. It was really interesting. That's an exclusive. You're the first person I told that yeah, story to, but good. it was like, it was quite emotional, nostalgic in a way. So I seem, I seem to t find ways of taking the nostalgia and making it contemporary. So yes, that's you've what done I'm doing. A, you've done a great job of that. There's no question about that. Uh, and before we return to um, the book and obviously Cobra Kai, what's your favorite Joe Pesci story? What do you got for me? Give me one. You got one. I got a good Joe Pesci story for you. Okay. I mean, I got a, I got a couple of them, but my favorite one is uh, <laughs> my favorite one is my wife and I are driving back. Uh, it is the first day of shooting on my cousin Vinny. Uh, for, no, no, they were having a little, uh, uh, you know, celebration party the night before we started shooting, and we were in Georgia, um, and we we're running running a little bit late. Um, so I was driving back and they were, we were in this area of Monticello, Georgia, there was deer all over the place and the sun was starting to set and I'm driving and I'm we're, we're behind schedule. I'm driving a turn and I wind up hitting a deer and my wife is hysterical, right? Because it, you know, it's traumatic. You hit, a, you hit the deer, what's going to end? The deer disappeared down this embankment. I didn't know what happened. She's like, she just crying hysterically like this. And I'm trying to calm her down and we pull up to our condo and uh, that we're renting there for the film. And Joe comes out, Pesci comes out. He goes, what's the matter? What's the matter? You know, he wants to know what's wrong. And he's, I, my wife's like, we hit a deer. And he, and I was like, I, 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 Joe, I tried to stop. And he said, don't worry about it. It happens to everybody. You know, he was really nurturing and wonderful. And he gave my wife a hug. He gave me a hug. He said, I'm going to go up to the thing, meaning the party. And I said, all right, we'll be up there in a minute. He said, don't worry about it. He gets in his car, takes off. It was on a cul-de-sac. He goes around the cul-de-sac with the car. And he just hits the brakes like, Argh! and you just see the red lights. And then he reverses the wheels backs up, opens the window and goes, dear killer, you effing dear killer. And he takes back off and goes up the thing. So there's my, there's my great uh, Pesci story. One of many. I know I took a long time to get to it. Oh, that's I have fantastic. It, that's but fantastic. It's a great, he just, he just set us up and he's, he's a spectacular actor. And my God, my cousin Vinny is one that it's the late for dinner movie, man. If it's on, you're going to be late for dinner. Yeah, I call that a remote drop. You know, you got to drop the remote no matter where you're picking it up. And, you know, this sounds like a very L.A. thing, what I'm about to say is, but I, I joined a golf club out here, and it's Pesci's, too. Uh -huh. I eat there all the time. And yep. I brought my kids one time, and they were, like, starstruck. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, did my wife show them Raging Bull or Goodfellas without <laughs> letting me know? Home and Alone. Then, Maybe Home Alone. That's what it was. And yeah. they were like, it's the guy from Home Alone. And he goes up to kids who are like that at the club and he leans into him and he says, I didn't break into your house right. yet. And he's, <laughs> he's great. He's it's, great. That's one of the greatest things. What a, it's amazing, man. Um, so Cobra Kai, the success of that as well, because as you pointed out, the fact that we're talking contemporary as well. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think makes it work this time around about contemporizing it do you think ralph because you and and uh billy zapka are you know 
terrifically matched to this mm -hmm. day, you know, and yeah. it's so much fun to watch. We had Martin Cove on the show just a few weeks ago to promote oh, the latest season. And yeah. by the way, him telling Sl Sly Stallone stories yeah. viral. <laughs> it, it just, it, I, I'm, I'm wondering what you think the, as you referred to it, special sauces for that. Too. Yeah, I think um, uh, credit goes to these three writers um, who created the show, John Hurwitz, uh, Hayden Slasberg and, and Josh Heald. They are, Karate Kid super fans. They know every piece, every nook, cranny, and fabric from the original films, and they they never lose sight of the themes, like I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that that sustain uh, that. And yet, they've created um, a heightened world, a karate soap opera, if you will, that has elements of a superhero <laughs> story. But yet, but yet is grounded in still those same same themes, and they they have added layers of backstory to characters. Listen, Karate Kid was very black and white, good over evil. Mm. Daniel San Miyagi good, Crease Johnny Lawrence bad. Right, Cobra Kai, your allegiance can change episode to episode. But even though the intentions are are good with almost every character, they're they're falling forward, skinning their knees, slipping. Um, you, 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 there's a little bit of good and a little bit of bad in everyone. And I think the secret sauce is taking, not losing sight of the, the, if, if there's a word called belovedness mm -hmm. or what we love about these characters and then enhancing that and, um, and adding other uh, layers and colors to it. And they do a beautiful job of that. And then they're, uh, then the OG folks coming back, whether it's Elizabeth Shue or Tamlin Tamita or Yuji Okamoto or, Randy Heller, who played my mom, they, you know, she comes back from the original film. The fans just love it because they're and they're all knocking it out of the park. No question. And um, season five just released in September, all available on Netflix, started off on YouTube. And now mm -hmm. it's a Netflix staple, Cobra Kai. So I, I apologize if I, I wrap up this interview by asking the same question I asked you years ago when you were on the set. But uh, it, it escapes me if I did. Do you consider The Karate Kid a sports movie? Ralph, I do. I write. I write to that in the uh, in in the uh, in the book in the waxing on book because I mean yes. So if you look at it, uh, is Rocky a sports movie, or is Rocky a love story? Mm -hmm. um, is Karate Kid a father and son story, or is it a sports movie? Is Hoosiers a sports movie? Yeah. Is is Feel the Dreams a sports movie? I would say so. I don't know. So here here's my thing. Karate. Karate mm. is not necessarily as popular as baseball, football, you know, even hockey for that matter. If you say you take a movie like Miracle, um, is Slapshot a sports movie? I guess so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right. so I think there's an, you know, um, I'll say one thing, and this is exactly what I wrote in, in, the, in the book or a piece of this. There, there are a few characters that I know of, certainly personally that don't light up a crowd at a baseball game or a hockey game as if you show the crane kick and you cut to me sitting there with you know my pretzel in my hand mm -hmm. it is a it is a roar of like the hometown hero so in that respect there's so so many times uh very few sporting events i could go to when i don't start hearing you're the best around or the glory of love and see them teeing up that guy with the handheld camera that uh, it's usually met with a big roar. So, uh, which is really, uh, you know, rewarding, flattering and uh, lends itself to me saying it must be a sports movie. Uh, the new book, again, Waxing on the Karate Kid and Me by Ralph Macchio is available now wherever you get your books. And again, seasons one through five, all streamable on Netflix uh, right now, and then, of course, The Karate Kid showed it to my kids multiple times. They know it. Mm -hmm. It's great to watch with your family as well. Um, I look forward to the musical, right? That's next? The musical? That's next. That's, That's what coming? they're saying. Yeah, okay. supposedly uh, next year. Robert yeah. Mark Heyman, who wrote the original film. Uh, it's, you know, it just, it's, it's unbelievable. the gift that keeps it's on rocking. It's unbelievable. So congrats on that in advance, and Thank we'll have you. you back on for that too, Ralph. That's great, man. Thanks. Thanks for the support on the book, and always great to see you, man. Right back at you. That's Ralph Macchio right here on The Rich Eisen Show. Catch The Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.